420, a little over 420 billion of that went to corporations. Next slide, please. So very briefly, and I can get into this more often uh, down the road, it, what was the Pentagon up to in Eastern Europe prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Again, I'm not excusing the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm providing context. This just doesn't happen in a vacuum. Nobody, no matter how demonic they are, just decides, ah, we're going to invade another country. Okay, there is context. There is history. U.S. military and industry was militarizing Eastern Europe for years, not just Ukraine, but other countries, for years prior to the February uh, 2022 invasion of Ukraine. Increasing the troop, U.S. troop presence, presence in Eastern Europe, in Poland, in the Baltic states, in Romania, and elsewhere. Uh, the U.S. military is something called preposition stock. Preposition stock is any of the big stuff you need to fight a war. It has that in many places across Europe as a whole. Okay? It never, by the way, the U.S. military never left Europe after the Cold War. It reduced its troop presence. It did not leave. And since the new great power competition arose several years back against Beijing and Moscow, the true presence has slowly gone up. And I can get into how that came about if you'd like. Uh, it also has nuclear weapons stored all across Europe. Uh, building military infrastructure in the contracts that I study, US and European construction firms are tasked with building and repairing constantly, ceaselessly, this never stops, building and repairing US and allied military infrastructure in Eastern Europe. Provocative military exercises along Russia's borders. Russia is not flying bombers in uh, the Hudson Bay. It is not flying bombers along Florida's coast. Right? The U.S. is, however, flying bombers and has been flying bombers along Russia's coast. It has been, fl it has been doing what they call freedom of navigation exercises in the Baltic and in the Black Sea. Training. It has trained allied militaries all across Eastern Europe. It has Washington. Washington, D.C. has abandoned arms treaties. Unilaterally. Said, ah, we're done. We're out. Rip it up. Gone. Okay? The Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, I think, was they left in 2002. The INF Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Force Treaty, I think they left in 2019, but I could be wrong on that. And the Open Skies Treaty, they left uh, last year, I believe. Open Skies was designed to have just a little bit of transparency in the other country's nuclear posture within their own country. So the Russians, in coordination with the U.S., would fly over the U.S. in um, aircraft together and say, all right, we, we see these sites, we see that sites, and vice versa. Okay? It, uh, is it vice versa or vice versa? Vice versa. Vice versa. Vice versa. Vice versa. Vice versa. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so that, that, it wasn't a... Um, it wasn't a perfect system, but Open Skies did have a little bit of truth uh, and fostered a little bit of understanding uh, between the two parties. And um, investigative reporting has shown that Washington is trying to undermine repeatedly the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which most countries in the world support. That's right. Also, as the New York Times reported in 2019, I think it was July 2019, but it could have been June, cyber operations against Russia in 2019 and prior, the U.S. government was engaged in, and since, engaged in cyber attacks and cyber operations against Russia's cyber infrastructure, including but not limited to electricity, power plants. And on top of that, I believe it was the end of last year, uh, there's a very good investigative journalist called, last name Dorfman, I think it's Stephen Dorfman, but I, uh, I could be wrong on the first name. He works for Yahoo News, and he had a very good investigative piece about how, under the Trump administration, Trump gave CIA um, a basically blank check authority to conduct cyber attacks against targets of its choosing at a time of its choosing. So CIA usually has to go to the White House, usually has to go to the White House get legal authority, the White House will say, yes, you can do this, or no, you can't do this, and the CIA will say, all right, well, whatever. And, but what they did under this was, you don't have to keep coming back 
CIA. You don't have to keep coming back to the White House. You choose what targets you want to attack using cyber weapons at a time of your choosing. And then what I see every day is sales from the U.S. war industry to every single Eastern European country, except for Belarus. So if you are sitting in Moscow, this is what you see. Right. This is not excusing the attack on Ukraine, but it is to provide context yeah, and history. And I think that's it. I'll turn it over to uh, Ryan right now. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'll sit and wait and give my talk and a piece of paper to read off of. Um, thanks so much, Christian. That was really informative and really troll in the level, in particular, of the military corporation's control. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more, picking up on the last note that Christian talked about, the focusing more specifically on Ukraine. And in particular, I want to talk about Ukraine as something of a meta crisis, meaning that this crisis in Ukraine, this war in Ukraine, is much bigger than just Ukraine. Now, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, of course, have larger geopolitical and regional implications, but this war stretches far beyond, in many senses, the scopes of those wars. The current situation with Russia and China and the US and NATO has been described as, and correctly so, I think, a new Cold War. But there's a deeper crisis going on than was happening in the previous Cold War in what is called sometimes in US policy circles the global American-led political and economic order in the sense that the American empire is in a state of decline. Now, it's not to say it's over, it's done, and as they say, dying beasts are most dangerous. The elite in this country have made a series of major miscalculations with the evasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. They spent two decades, trillions of dollars, and were unable to establish pliable and pliant puppet states in those countries. In Afghanistan, obviously, the Taliban defeated the US and has retaken their country. Um, and in Iraq, the current Iraqi government is increasingly hostile to the US. Most of the Iraqi oil is controlled by Chinese companies. Iran has gained significant influence in Iraq and has used that to spread influence throughout the region. Now, the interests of the American capitalists who run this empire are different than the interests of the people of this country. But I want to point out, these two decades of wars, although they had some benefits, some people profited immensely, were overall a huge waste for the American empire. They sank a huge amount of resources into these wars and got very little in terms of increasing their power and influence globally out of them. Quite the opposite. These wars, as well as the war in Ukraine, show uh, some, something of a dangerous pattern. Empires in decline run by increasingly out of touch and delusional elites from Donald Trump to Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton often seek to reclaim the lost, their lost glory through aggressive military assertion. This is quite dangerous and they're talking openly about the stuff in Ukraine in terms of winning a nuclear war against Russia. That's being openly discussed by the US media and recently even on Meet the Press they had a, a whole thing about what would nuclear war with China look like and how would the U.S. win that. It, it's getting quite surreal. This conflict, as I mentioned, is about far more than Ukraine. E the war is likely to drag on for some time, but even if it did end in the short or medium term, the fundamental issues that gave rise to this war will remain. In particular, great power competition is only likely to intensify in the coming years, especially as we're entering into a period of major global economic downturn. Given this new Cold War and the dangers of the US elite potentially could turn this into a hot war, whether it be in Ukraine, over Taiwan, or elsewhere, those of us here in the US who are willing to stand against the war machine have our work cut up for us. The future the elite have planned for us is no future at all, even if the US wins this Cold War. We need to take a long, hard look at the global situation, as well as the major dynamics domestically, and chart a course forward to find a way out of this mess. This is no easy task, but I hope that today we can take a few modest steps to gaining some clarity on it. So what's going on in Ukraine? I hope that many of you are aware that this war was in many senses provoked by the US and NATO. Christian just spoke on that a bit. Um, and like him, I'm opposed to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I, I'm not looking to apologize for Russia's actions, but I think we need to understand the rules of the great power competition, the dynamics that are playing out, as these things don't happen in a vacuum. There's a certain logic. 
or rules to these great games that the big bullies play. And countries establish certain red lines, which if crossed, will elicit a reaction, including a military reaction. The US crossed numerous of these in the case of Ukraine, which elicited the response of an invasion by Russia. The US elite were aware of this and their actions leading up to it. Uh, they were fairly open throughout these provocations about their intent to weaken Russia with a war in Ukraine. But it's often hard for us in the US to step out of the media bubble in this country and to see the world other than through the warped lens of American exceptionalism and related jingoism. So let me put it in terms that may clarify the matter. Imagine for a second that Russia signed a major military alliance with Venezuela, Colombia, Jamaica, and other Latin American countries aimed at containing American influence in the region, but they promised not to expand this alliance any further. Then Russia breaks this promise and stages a pro-Russian coup in Panama. They promptly take control of the Panama Canal, station Russian troops there, and begin conducting major war games off the coast of Florida, simulating a war with the United States. A few years later, they signed deals and staged some coups in Nicaragua, Honduras, and El Salvador. More Russian troops are deployed to these countries, along with missile systems and nuclear-armed bombers. Russia cuts arms deals with them as well, flooding these countries with the latest Russian weaponry. Then, a pliant U.S. Met puppet in Mexico is replaced in a coup, which Russian diplomats are caught bragging about in leaks with a Russian puppet. This Russian puppet then promptly arms far-right fascist forces with weapons Russia is pouring into Mexico, stations them on the U.S.-Mexico border, and makes them some of the leading forces in the Mexican military. And then this pro-Russian government in Mexico announces, with Russian support, that it is starting plans to acquire nuclear weapons. <laughs> exactly. In this scenario, no one in the U.S. will be surprised when the U.S. government took military action in Mexico and likely beyond. Of course, the scenario I'm describing is not fiction. The proper names are just changed. Exactly. This is basically exactly what has happened with NATO expansion over the past few decades, with Mexico and this fictional account being Ukraine. The Russian diplomats caught bragging in the coup in Mexico in this thought experiment were, of course, U.S. diplomats, including current Under Secretary of State Victoria Nuland. In 2014, tapes leaked of her talking with then U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Jeffrey Pyatt, about plots to replace Russia's pro, sorry, Ukraine's pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych, with a U.S. puppet, which is exactly what happened shortly thereafter in the 2014 Euro Maiden protests in, uh, in Ukraine. Again, if the U.S. invaded Mexico in this situation, it wouldn't be a surprise to those of us here in the United States. I would certainly condemn the U.S. in this situation, but I would also be sure to condemn the Russian government for the provocations and escalations that led up to the invasion. To not do so would be surreal. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, most American media has departed from reality, and there's a question how much reality they were dealing with before this invasion, but that's another thing. They've departed from reality into the realm of surre the surreal. Watching MSNBC, CNN, and Fox News often leaves one with the impression of being Alice in Wonderland. The stories presented in American news media about Ukraine are often so outlandish and oversimplified that one could be forgiven for thinking that they were satire. The entire explanation of the war, for example, is often reduced to personality defects, real or imagined, of Putin, a narrative that plays well in our extremely individualist culture, but which has little relation to reality. The dangers of nuclear war, if mentioned at all in the US media, are generally shrugged off with assertions that the US can win any nuclear conflict. Given the US military's recent track record of defeats, this would almost be funny if it did not indicate that the people who run this country are really as deranged as the generals and politicians depicted in Stanley Kubrick's famous film, Dr. Strangelove. Outside of the US, the complexities of the situation are often better understood, although not, not always. Condemning Russia's invasion often goes hand in hand with condemning the aggression and provocations of the US and NATO. Even the Pope recently emphasized the central role that the US played in provoking this war. But here in the United States, American chauvinism runs so deep that not even a single supposedly progressive Democratic politician stood against the latest bill that allocates tens of billions of more dollars for this war. Not AOC, not Bernie, not Cori Bush, not Ilhan Omar, not one of them. The strongest opposition in D.C. that we are currently seeing, and it's pretty minor, 
came from a small number of politicians supported by the populist right. And actually, most liberal voters are now cheering for this war, a point that I will come back to later. The only hope we have is if we can get out, the only hope we have, if we can get out of this morass of confusion and propaganda promoted by the pompous elite who run this country. But this is easier said than, said than done in many senses. Still, a bit of work together can go a long way. One basic step we can take is to cast aside illusions that anyone in Washington, D.C., Democrat or Republican, will save us. I'm going to keep going. I just need a sip of water real quick. But before talking about a few ideas I have on the way forward, I want to spell out a bit more of what I mean by the Ukraine war being a meta-crisis. As I think clarity on the present situation is essential if we're to have any hope of getting out of this mess. We have to really look at what's going on in Ukraine and beyond, in, this, in the world we're living in. Long before the war, as I mentioned, Ukraine has been a site of tension between the U.S. Uh, and its NATO allies and Russia. But this meta-crisis is about more than Russia. It's intrinsically linked to U.S. competition with China over who will be the top dog in the global pecking order. Given the long-standing push to isolate Russia economically and politically by the United States, the Russian elite have grown closer with China than with the EU and the U.S. As part of Obama's plan to contain the rise of China, he outlined a strategy known as the Pivot to the Pacific. In this strategy, the U.S. planned to A, get most of its military out of the Middle East and reposition the military to contain China, mostly in the Pacific. B, develop domestic fossil fuel infrastructure to reduce dependence on the Middle East oil supplies and ensure that the U.S. would have access to its own production of oil and other fossil fuels for any future world war. And C, keep the Saudis and UAE in their camp and split Qatar off from Iran by building a series of pipelines for oil and gas to Europe. And D, use these pipelines to weaken Russia's dominant position in the EU gas markets, where, at the time, Russia enjoyed or controlled about 33% of the gas markets in Europe and around 100% of those markets in Eastern Europe. This plan, the pivot to the Pacific, largely failed in many respects, in part due to the ineptitude of the U.S. state, in part due to strong opposition from Russia, and in particular in Syria, where Assad played a key role in blocking the construction of these proposed pipelines. And Syria's vetoing of the pipelines at Russia's behest was a key reason the Obama administration was so rabid in their efforts to topple Assad, at least until Obama's own generals opposed him in this and started sharing intelligence with the Assad government about the locations of the far-right forces that Obama was arming there. But that's a whole other story, although it follows, it follows a similar pattern to what's going on in Ukraine. Now, I mentioned the Syrian civil war, and I don't want to get into it in detail right now, but because as much, the Syrian civil war, as much as NATO expansion eastward towards Russia, is a central part of the background leading up to the Ukraine war. I'm trying to use this example of Syria to illustrate the underlying nature of the global system in which we live. As the world is presently structured, competition between the great powers is a zero-sum game. The world is parceled up into relative spheres of influence, and any gain for the U.S. is a loss for another power and vice versa. This is not, about, not just about control of key resources like oil and gas and other fossil fuels, but also about the control of market share and access to cheap labor. So is it any surprise in this regard that when the US, through maneuvers in Ukraine, moved to push Russia out of key markets in Eastern and Central Europe, that there was a response from Russia? Ukraine is a key transit point for Russian oil and gas to the rest of Europe, and the, Ukrainian econo or sorry, the Russian economy largely revolves around the export of fossil fuels. Unless we understand some of these dynamics, e uh, and, uh, sorry, unless we understand some of these dynamics, events in the international and even domestic arena will remain unclear to us. And we will be susceptible to all sorts of surreal U.S. state propaganda, which reduces geopolitics to pseudo-Freudian analysis of the personalities of world leaders and or thinly veiled racist stereotypes about other countries and peoples. This Russian response and these larger dynamics are not unique to Ukraine. Much of what is left of the anti-war movement in this country has not taken stock of this fundamental shift in the global situation. The U.S. enjoyed a period of relatively uncontested global dominance after the fall of the Soviet Union. And during this period, the U.S. waged wars in Afghanistan and Iraq 
as well as elsewhere, which while disastrous for the peoples of those countries, did not threaten a global conflagration and major world war. But now, with the rise of China and the relative strength of Russia, we can expect that future US wars will be intense proxy competitions with these powers. This is very important for us in the United States to understand. The nature of these wars the US is getting involved in is fairly different now. It doesn't mean we shouldn't oppose them. In some senses, it means opposing them is harder, as we're seeing today. In this so-called great game between these big bullies, we, the people of the United States and the people of the world, lose regardless of who wins. The situation is increasingly dangerous and unstable, especially as we are now heading into a major economic downturn, as I mentioned earlier, which could well be worse than the Great Depression. With a shrinking pie, competition between these big bullies is only going to intensify as they fight with each other to control the world, with pieces of the world. Right now, it is hard to overstate the idiotic and delusional buffoonery of the US elite. Salivating over the prospects of weakening Russia, they are recklessly risking nuclear war and have imposed a series of economic sanctions on Russia, which, while they've had a limited impact on the Russian economy, are causing chaos globally in everything from energy markets to global food supplies and would likely lead to major famines around the world this year. Up until recently, the Biden administration has refused to have any diplomatic contact with the Russian government about this war, period. No discussions. None at all. In fact, today, the US and UK stated that there will be no offering for de-escalation. Now, recently, actually, the minimal contact did happen through the Secretary of Defense, not the diplomats. They have pushed, the US elite have pushed escalation after escalation. Politicians from Biden to Lindsey Graham have openly called for the assassination of Putin and regime change. Think about the implications of this for a minute. They're trying to sow chaos and destabilization in a country with the most nuclear weapons in the world. I mean, does that sound like a sane and rational and well thought out policy? I don't think so. Uh, but beyond that, think in reverse. What if China or Russia called for the assassination of Biden for his support for the war in Yemen or the recent deployment of US troops to Somalia? where atrocities in both those places are being committed similar to those that are happening in the Ukraine war. The US elite have flooded Ukraine with arms, as Christian already spoke to, spending at a pace that exceeds the rate of the war in Afghanistan. In fact, with the latest package, in just three months, US spending on Ukraine has exceeded the annual budget of the war in Afghanistan. The idea that the elite of this country whether they be Republicans or Democrats or big capitalists with no party affiliation, care about the people of Ukraine is a joke. First, we can see from Hillary Clinton to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mark Milley, they have made it clear that they want to drag this war on as long as possible to bleed Russia out. They don't want a quick victory for Ukraine. And the insurgency training the CIA has been doing in Ukraine for years shows that their plan from the beginning was to sacrifice Ukraine in a long, drawn-out conflict with Russia that they hope can last years, if not decades. Second, the weapons the U.S. has supplied to Ukraine, in many cases, have been provided to the furthest right groups in Ukrainian society. Neo-Nazi groups like the Azov Battalion, who are now being cheered as heroes by the U.S. media, are some of the major fighting forces in the Donbass region. These forces trace their roots back to the Ukrainian Nazi collaborators who, during the Second World War, carried out many massacres against tens of thousands of Jews, Poles, and others. The Azov Battalion and other far-right forces in Ukraine wear swastikas and other Nazi regalia on their uniforms. They do Sieg Heils, and they openly proclaim their support for Hitler, and they openly speak of their plans to exterminate the Jews. Those are their words. They have been the center of international training for white supremacist and far-right forces who have traveled from the United States and other countries around the world, including Europe and New Zealand, to train with them, learning on the arms the US government provided for them. Even the FBI has voiced their concerns about this fact. The Christchurch shooter in New Zealand cited the Azov Brigade as his major influence and inspiration. He trained with them in Ukraine. The recent mass murderer in Buffalo also cited the Azov Battalion as his inspiration. 
And on the front of his deranged manifesto was one of their logos, and they feature it prominently throughout its 180 pages. But what could go wrong with the US government sending huge amounts of arms to groups like this? It's very clear, of course, if we just look at things for a minute. The future of, for Ukrainians is obviously quite bleak right now with this proxy war and Russia's invasion. But I want to emphasize the future that the US elite had in store for, the, for Ukrainians if Russia had invaded was also quite grim. The US and NATO's sponsorship of far-right forces speaks to this. These forces have committed atrocities in recent years in Ukraine, not only against the ethnic Russians who make up a sizable portion of the Ukrainian population, but also against Jews, Muslims, ethnic Ukrainians, and others. What's more, joining the EU, which is often framed as the goal for Ukraine, is not a rosy prospect. For poor Eastern European countries, joining the EU means the imposition of devastating neoliberal policies that open the country for loot by wealthy US and EU companies. They would be handing the keys to their economy over to French, German, and American banks, so to speak. And they already had done that to some extent, but joining the EU would have taken it that much further. This leads to mass exoduses from countries. For example, we can see this in Poland, where after they joined the EU, over a million people migrated out of the country per year on average. These refugees from neoliberal structural adjustment policies were not covered in the media. We didn't see the very real and sad pictures of them as they became migrant laborers in wealthy EU countries, working in conditions that numerous investigations have found to be akin to slavery. Countless others from this, these poor Eastern European countries like Poland, after they joined the EU, were trafficked, becoming sex slaves in the brothels of wealthy EU countries like Germany and the Netherlands that have legalized the sex trade. So let's cast aside illusions the US elite have a humanitarian goals in mind with this war. This is pure political calculation to weaken a strategic rival. Arming and promoting far-right forces to secure corporate and state interests is nothing new for the US. It is right out of a long established playbook that people around the world from Central America to the Balkans have had to endure numerous times before. There is no humanitarian goal or purpose here. It is pure realpolitik, though the US elite seems to be fairly incompetent players at this game at present. And I want to talk about the incompetence and the ineptitude. Again, this doesn't mean the US is not dangerous. The US military is very powerful. The US intelligence agencies torture and assassinate people left and right. What I'm trying to point out is that we're an empire in decline. The elite who run this country are out of touch with the basic reality. They are making a series of miscalculations. And this is not well understood in the US. There was, for example, a lot of media attention on the faux pas, real or imagined, of Donald Trump. Many of them were real, a few of them were made up, because the media became kind of a constant cycle of what, it, what did Trump say today. Um, but the truth is that the Biden administration is not much better. While they initially claimed to unite Europe in boycotting Russia, this has turned out to be largely overstated grandiosity. Some EU countries like Poland are quite bellicose, but major powers in Europe, especially Germany and France, have been advocating a more moderate approach to dealing with Russia and have been resisting US pressure to refuse to negotiate with Putin. Some European countries have even been quite defiant uh, in efforts to isolate Russia, such as Hungary uh, and other EU countries, although to a lesser degree, they've grown more sympathetic to Russia in recent years, uh, in particular due to some skilled diplomatic maneuvering on Russia's part, uh, where the US kind of taken a more heavy-handed approach. Major US allies like Brazil and India and even functional vassals like Mexico have refused to join in US sanctions against Russia. In India, despite being part of Quad, the new US alliance to contain China, excuse me, has just a few days ago issued a joint statement with Russia, China, and Brazil as part of BRICS, pushing for a more multipolar world. Numerous other countries around the world have also refused to toe the line. In short, short the world is far from united in opposing Russia and supporting the US imperial maneuvers. And while the much hyped US sanctions were supposed to cripple the Russian economy and reduce the ruble to rubble, as Biden put it, this has been far from the case. The ruble is stronger versus the dollar than before the war and has reached eight year highs against the euro. Oil and gas revenue were up 50% for Russia compared to last year. 
And when US companies like Visa, MasterCard, and McDonald's left Russia, Russian companies and state entities swooped in, gobbling up their vacated market share and creating hundreds of millions of dollars in new revenue for Russian corporations and the state treasury. In short, efforts by the Biden administration to isolate Russia economically and politically have been an abysmal failure. And side note, that while they have focused so much of their attention on Russia, their diplomatic efforts in other parts of the world have been neglected and or similarly inept. They have, for example, failed to appoint an ambassador to more than a dozen Latin American countries, including Brazil, which is the largest economy in Latin America, despite being in office for over 16 months. This reflects a growing trend where the US elite increasingly favors military might and economic coercion over the subtleties of diplomacy. Of course, all three of these methods are an essential part of an imperialist playbook, but the tendency towards a more ham-fisted and bellicose approach is quite notable. What's more, provoking Russia into this war and sanctioning them has created a global crisis in food and raw materials, despite failing to cripple the Russian economy. Russia is a huge exporter of food, as is Ukraine. The two combine to provide 28% of global wheat exports, 29% of barley, and 15% of corn exports, as well as 75% of sunflower oil exports. The majority of this food is sold to poor Middle Eastern and African countries, which do not have strong domestic food supplies. Russia is also the largest exporter of raw materials in the world, not just fossil fuels, but also aluminum, nickel, and other things which are essential to production of goods and services around the world. And now, there are critical global shortages of many of these raw materials, as well as massive inflation due to these shortages. Since the war began, the chaos in global supply chain has caused other countries around the globe to announce major protectionist measures on the export of food and other products. In a highly globalized economy, this means more disruptions to supply chains and more shortages of fuel and food. What we are seeing in Sri Lanka right now with the major protests against the government because of these shortages and unrest is just the beginning. And this is a divided thing. It's a very dire situation for the people. But as we saw in the Arab Spring, in these situations, people do rise up and topple oppressive governments. So it's not all bleak. And I'll come to that more towards the end. In the US, we even are projected to face major diesel shortages in the East Coast, at least this summer, which means disruption of goods and services, more shortages of essential things, not just baby food and as well as rolling blackouts from California to the Midwest, which may last for years, according to Bloomberg, a recent report they put out. And The Economist just published an article yesterday, I believe, saying that fam a famine of biblical proportions is brewing globally. And with all this, the, uh, and with all of the US diplomatic and economic responses failing so spectacularly to isolate Russia, is it any surprise that the elite in this country have ramped up military spending seemingly believing that this is their last and best resort. At the current rate of spending, the US expenditure on the war will exceed the entire annual budget of the Russian military in a few months, maybe as soon as next month. Much like with the war of, with Iraq and Afghanistan, this money will do little more than enrich a few billionaire bankers and weapons manufacturers while sponsoring death and destruction in Ukraine. It seems likely at the present, given the present dynamics, that it will fail to secure the interests of the US empire and the capitalists that run this country. Despite the propaganda here in the United States, Russia is winning the war in Ukraine, although with some sloppiness. They have captured most of the Donbass, secured a land bridge to Crimea, and will begin their push west to Odessa soon, possibly continuing all the way to Moldova and making Ukraine a landlocked country. Meanwhile, the U.S. cannot produce Javelin missiles fast enough to supply the Ukrainians with them at, pre at the pr present rate of use. Similar bottlenecks are disrupting the supply of other key military hardware, even as the U.S. elite throw ever larger sums of money at the problem, which seems to be their solution to most things, throw money at it and hope it'll work out, which of course is not generally a way to fix things. It is a great way to enrich a number of corporations and, and people. All of this paints a grim picture. A delusional and bellicose elite running this country, driving us to the brink of nuclear war and helping to create a major global famine in the process. However, I'm an optimist. But in order to be optimistic in a real sense, and not just naive, we need to face the stark and difficult realities in front of us. 
It's the only way we can chart a course forward out of this big mess in which we are currently living. And speaking on this, in the point that standing against the US provocations and escalations does not mean supporting Putin or this war that he's waging and the Russian elite are waging. I wanted to quote from uh, uh, German Marxist Wilhelm Liebknecht, who people may know was a comrade of Rosa Luxemburg and was, was killed uh, by the German government during the revolution in 1919. Yeah, the Social Democrats it, it killed him. He said, our primary enemy is at home during World War I. He was speaking against the tendency of the Social Democrats in Germany and, and around the world to rally behind their own elite during that war, to say, we need to support them, support the motherland, support the fatherland. This was a trend then. We see it as a trend now. Trudy spoke so well about it. It's very dangerous and disturbing. But if we look at things clearly and what the people are who run this country, what they're doing, what sort of calculus they're making, then it becomes clear that they really are not our friends, that we can't play a game of lesser evilism and say, oh, because they're opposing Putin, we should rally behind them. We can't be drawn in by the war propaganda that frames Putin as the new Hitler. And I think we should oppose Putin and the war there that he's waging, but to be drawn in by this war propaganda that the US leader pushing, encourage us to line up behind the US war machine, behind all these corporations that Christian just broke down for us, and to support them in supposedly fighting the good fight. While Putin is certainly an oppressive ruler and his government is corrupt, that is something for the Russian people to deal with. I think we can and should support them in their battles against corruption, censorship, repression, and more. However, allowing our support for them to be channeled into the maneuvers of the U.S. state will hurt the Russian people, not help them. Likewise, supporting the designs of the murderous and rapacious, rapacious maniacs who run this country based on the belief that they are sincere in their pledges to help Ukraine is not only delusional, it is dangerous. Our compliance is essential, essential for the smooth functioning of the U.S. empire. As we have seen in this country, mass mobilizations of dissent, and in particular, those that are able to reach the U.S. troops and support their dissent, are a massive impediment to the war machine. And to Christian's point that most people who join the U.S. military are not bloodthirsty maniacs. It's functionally an economic draft in this country. 80% of the rank and file troops are drawn from the 20% 20, 20 of the poorest parts of the country. And they're drawn in for reasons based on the economic devastation there, the hope often to have something of a better future not crushed in debt peonage. And if anti-war movement can't reach them, then we can't do so much. If Instead of marching to the beat of the, if instead we remain pliant and march to the beat of the war drums, we have a very grim f future in front of us, even if we avoid a nuclear war. Our compliance provides openings for the elite to carry out massive campaigns of censorship and suppression of dissent at home, as they did during World War I, and as they're doing right now. They're doing this right now, censoring, suppressing dissent on a level we haven't seen since McCarthyism in this country. And it's being done to applause, excitement, cheering from a lot of the liberal voices who are opposing the war of Iraq and Afghanistan. People, even within the elite, are being labeled as traitors for basic criticisms of US policy. And when people who are like, people like Tulsi Gabbard, who are part of the establishment, are raising criticisms and are being called traitors, then all of us, ordinary people, should be very worried. Because that tells us what the elite think of dissent. In the name of fighting Russian disinformation, people are being censored left and right on social media platforms. There's unprecedented coordination between major news networks, the CIA, the NSA, uh, the tech companies, and so on, to censor through an initiative, which you can look up, called the Trusted News Initiative, which was created by the BBC a number of years ago. And at the same time this is all going on, basic criticism of US foreign policy is increasingly being labeled as extremism, and the Biden administration has just announced a new war on domestic terror. This should make us quite frightened and concerned. Nominally, this is framed at white supremacist forces, but the real target is the people of this country. And you can see the Democrats' language, which, which is parallel to the neocons' language, where anyone who opposes them is increasingly labeled as an extremist. We should think about that word seeping into the common language in the country. It's quite a dangerous operation that they're carrying out, and people aren't, I think, nearly aware of it, not as much as they should be.
Right now, it is not easy to take a stand against the U.S. involvement in this war. Many Americans, steeped in the noxious, noxious logic of lesser evilism, are jumping for joy that they get to root for the home team again. Now that the U.S. is supposedly the lesser evil compared to Putin, framed as the new Hitler, and so on. Fed years of ridiculous conspiracy theories that Russia was responsible for the election of Donald Trump, many liberals have been primed for this war and are now eagerly cheering the Biden administration as it sleepwalks to the edge of World War III. Of course, the Russiagate conspiracy theories are based on an unwillingness to look squarely at the way that the Democratic Party serves corporate interests as much as the Republicans do, and how many voters, in particular in rural parts of America, were disillusioned with Hillary's hollow promises after eight years of the Obama administration. This unwillingness to look at the hard reality in front of us is not isolated to Democratic Party voters. It is a common delusion in American society. But unless we cast aside such illusions, then we do not have hope, as we will constantly be fooled by the jingoism pumped out by corporate news networks, social media algorithms, and a pliant intellectual class which makes its living licking the boots of the corporate elite. However, we can take real steps here and now to rebuild a movement in this country which is capable of taking a stand against this war and the broader designs of the American empire. The near total control of American society, which is not absolute control, but it is a lot of control, by the military industrial complex, the big banks, the corporate elite, and the politicians of these two rotten parties is not in the interests of the vast majority of the American people. These crooks who run this country are not only devastating the world, they are also bleeding us dry at home. However, rebuilding the anti-war movement will require us to face difficult truths, to reach out to untraditional allies. We need to break away from ritualistic protests which appease our consciences but do nothing to build up our movement and pressure the elite. We need to leave the comfortable confines of established middle-class liberal circles and reach out to the poor and working class in particular. This means not only oppressed minorities and the poor sections of cities and housing projects, but also to the poor rural population, including a significant section of the white working class that supported Trump. It is not hard to do this, but it does mean breaking out of established habits and charting a new course forward that is not beholden to the logic of the two-party system of begging those in power to do the right thing. Only this way, only in this way can we get beyond the present lackadaisical morass in which the anti-war movement remains stuck. Ah. So we have about an hour or so left before we gotta start cleaning up. Um, so we're gonna do some Q&A. Uh, um, so you mentioned a lot of what led up to what happened in Ukraine, and to the average person, they, they, like, it's not their fault, they just don't care. You can say that with a lot of issues, that it really takes a, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of complexity to a lot of the stuff that we face in our daily lives. And a lot of people work, they want to come home, they want to drink a beer, eat, and spend time with their families. I see Putin invading, I'm not saying me, but like, I mean, you know, yes. someone who supports what the U.S. is doing in Ukraine. I see what he's doing, and it just makes sense for me to be like, yes, we should oppose him. What's, you know, what is a way for, our, I guess, to, to kind of construct an anti-U.S., anti-Russian, like, argument that, you know, without having to give them the whole backstory of this is a, a posturing by these two nations, and the Ru U.S. was doing this, Russia was doing, you know, all this stuff, and just kind of simplifying it, I guess, into a coherent message that can reach all those people that you mentioned earlier. So, um, more broadly, I've had a little bit, a little bit of success with my extended family on this matter, just by saying, number one, since 1945, the U.S. government has never, never been on the right side of a conflict, okay? And then, number two, I encourage them to turn off corporate media. And it doesn't answer your question, but it does provide a more broader uh, approach to the war machine in general. And I've had a little bit of success with some extended, um, quote-unquote, liberal uh, family members who, once they turn off corporate media, 
and in their very limited spare time are uh, free to, uh, you know, like you said, they're working two jobs with you know, a side gig in a neoliberal economic system that absolutely beats up the working class. They, are occasionally, they do occasionally have enough free time to look at some independent news websites and then they're able to formulate their own opinion. So I would say encourage them to turn off corporate media uh, and to uh, understand that the U.S. government has never been on the right side of conflict since uh, the end of the Second World War. So. Yeah, that, that, that's great, uh, great points. And if people can do that, then they can really start to break out of stuff. What I tried with, with limited success in talking to um, some people was to emphasize all the establishment voices in the US, people who are terrible. Like Henry Kissinger even said, if the US goes forward with Ukraine joining NATO, it would be a provocation to Russia and probably lead to war. And, and people like him, Sometimes if people are you know, less aware of what's going on globally, we'll say, okay, well, let me give a pause if so many in the establishment were saying this would lead to war. Um, sometimes that's not enough. I mean, I, for what it's worth, I have my own father now thinks I'm a right-wing uh, extremist because I, I'm opposing this war. So, which, you know, for people who know me, it, it's silly, but there is this thing that right now is saying, it's if you stand against this, you're probably a white supremacist, conspiracy theorist, so on, blah, blah, blah. And, and that's tough. It, it, and if people watch corporate news all day long, that's what they hear. That's what you hear is that. And, and it, it's a weird situation because the only mainstream news source that's opposing this that I've seen is Tucker Carlson. Yeah. Now, I don't support Tucker Carlson. I think it's good that at least he's opposing this, despite all the other stuff he says that I don't agree with. But so there's a thing that they can do on most, most places, say, oh, you oppose this, you must support Putin, you must be Tucker, and Putin equals Trump, so it all kind of fits in. It's hard to get through that. I don't have any easy answers. I'd like to add to that. But in addition, when the US was on the right side, it was allies with the Soviet Union, the foundation of Russia, fighting against the, the, the Air with people who are now in Ukraine, the fascists. So in this case, it's really clear which side to be on. To me, I'm with Russia for this. Not in everything, but for this particular thing, yes. If I can keep going with it. I have some comments, but I'll wait my turn. Okay. All right. I'll try to make my way across the room a little bit. So, so my question is, a real disturbing trend that I've seen in society is there is some awareness that this is threatening a nuclear confrontation between Russia and the US. And yet, a lot of people, including the elite in Washington and in general society, are kind of shrugging at this. It's like, ah, so what? You know, and that's, to me, a disturbing and some of a new reaction. I, I don't know, historically, if people have actually looked at the face of a, of a new, imagine during the Cuban Missile Crisis, if people said, oh, so much if the bomb goes off. You know, but we had a good run. And so my question in particular is, Christian, do you see that among veterans? Is there somewhat of a, diff a more attuned reaction to this, or is this shared there as well? And you know, what does this represent, and what, what the hell can we do about this? Because that's it's quite disturbing if, if we're at that level right now. Uh, it's tough to say. I think the uh, it's tough for me to speak to what the uh, what U.S. veterans um, believe it, uh, across the border in general. I know that's not what you what you were saying, but it's. Um, Veterans, like the rest of society, are uh, fractured. They um, have different uh, political beliefs. I've seen some. I don't want to plug, my, you know, my own group, but they're, <laughs> I'm part of this group called the Eisenhower Media Network, which takes independent um, veterans and some, I believe, some former uh, civilian intelligence professionals who uh, are part of this part of this group who just who are anti-war and who provide an alternative voice to what you get in corporate media, whether it's CNN, Fox, MSNBC, or whatever. So there are some people out there who understand the nature of the beast, but it, it, it's few and far between. Uh, among my, my uh, veteran friends, there are some people who believe what is put on CNN and MSNBC. There are some who believe what is put on Fox News. So it's, it's, it's a mixed bag like anything else. I don't know how to, other than steady working class organizing, uh, oppose this, this beast. The one thing, uh, so what I'm studying right now 
in my spare time is fascism. And fascism is, it has a concrete definition, it is the blend of corporate uh, might with government authority, with a lot of nationalism sprinkled on top. And what is that? That is the military industrial complex. So, and the only thing that fascism fears is a united, organized working class. So, while we don't have a lot of time to achieve that, the end goal, if we can dodge nuclear war, is a working class that is united across racial lines and refuses to get split apart when the ruling class uses its handful of techniques. The, the, te the techniques that the ruling class uses to divide the working class are the same, they've always been the same, they don't have a new game, but we keep falling for it. So the only thing I can offer is uh, the hope, the glimmer, that at the end of the day, we get a united working class across racial lines that is able to form a front against the big business industry, the big business groups that run the country and dominate the political process and, yeah, it's an it's a incomplete answer, but it's the best I got, right? Yeah, just quickly, and then we have a lot of questions. I'll say, I think part of what we're seeing with this apathy is the population in this country has been trained, which is people are generally pretty hopeless. There's a lot of bad stuff going on, and there have been a tremendous proliferation of distractions put in front of people, of basically that promote a relatively unified ideology which is that reality is no impediment to you doing you, doing whatever you want to do. So it, it, bad news, go on Instagram and look at some influencer buying a cup of coffee and think about how you could make it, live your dreams. And, and of course, this doesn't actually happen for 99.99% of people who, who do this, but there's been such a, I think a population has been trained right now, bad news to look away from reality. It's not everyone, and it's a tough situation, but I think that's why, we're part of the reason at least, we're seeing such apathy towards the risk of annihilation of the whole world in the not so distant future. I have in the back first. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, nuclear war was so 80s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, uh, the, 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 it's, it, it's going to be years into this catastrophe until we can kind of put out enough ideas, some, enough ideas, and things have gotten bad enough that there's a, a, any room for change in, uh, in U.S. policy. Um, or possibly the election will trip it up and we'll be at war with Iran instead, which seems likely after, after, after Joe Biden's doing, uh, going into his next election. But um, the questions are, um, if, we're, if we're looking eventually for negotiations in Ukraine, do we have to start pushing now for uh, autonomy for Donbass, since they voted, like Crimea, to get the hell out of that Nazi country we ruined and created with our coup in 2014. So is a slogan we're going to have to be looking at, Ukraine out of Donbass, because under, under, under Russia's argument, um, and, uh, a legalistic argument for, for, for under the UN, um, they recognized a, a breakaway republic and a new ally, and that they've actually, they're there to repel an invasion. Um, and considering that the invading force is Nazis, um, that we installed uh, uh, in our coup, um, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with them. But the question is, if the self-determination for Donbass isn't, isn't going eventually to be something we have to push in order to say that, no, a negotiation, it's not, we want negotiation which, in which, at which Russia will give us everything we want, but we want a negotiation, um, and we are willing to give the people of Donbass their freedom as part of it. The other issue is just, let's remember when we talk about Putin that that is not a democracy, but that he has with the oligarchs we put in in the 90s. He does not have the power to make Russia a democracy. And he's an overwhelmingly popular leader with an overwhelming popular mandate. Now part of that is based on the shape that uh, autocracy and gangsterism in Russia is going to give to the, the process. But we have to remember that his leader, that, that Putin is more, is uh, the only possible democratic choice for that country given the, uh, 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 the public's uh, 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 relative hatred for anyone else, um, and that uh, our country isn't terribly democratic either, although it has a, uh, um, uh, although, although it has as much freer speech and much fewer gangsters killing journalists. That isn't yeah. a question, that was just a statement. No, so, so, I'm sorry, oh, wait, 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 what yeah, happens yeah, yeah. to the or something? <laughs> the reality that the U.S. elite and the British elite who are kind of towing the line and hoping that somehow this, they can parlay this into more global influence, which 
I'm doubtful about, but you know, their dreams of regaining their lost empire are there. Their, their thought is there's no need to negotiate with, with Russia. Now the reality, as I said, is, is Russia is winning this war. I anticipate that eventually that will be acknowledged in negotiations and when they do happen, and that a significant portion of Ukraine will be carved off into either explicitly part of Russia or part of Russia's sphere of influence. Um, now, th that, it, there's some complexities. It has a divided character. As you noted, the situation in the Donbass for a lot of people do want to join Russia. Given the prospect of living under a kind of Azov rule, it's not so good. My own thought, though, is that in the US, it's not the key thing for us to clarify. It's not so central. We have so much more basic stuff to clarify to an American audience about the dynamics of these. And I think there's also a bunch of people we want to unite with who are going to have some different opinions on that. Uh, you know, exactly how to handle the national complexities of the stuff there. You know, I personally am against uh, annexations by Russia or any other country uh, of other countries' territory. Uh, there's a question of national movements that are sponsored by a powerful country. Those like, for example, the US has been supporting the Kurdish movements in Syria. Now the Kurdish movements they have in Syria, I think the Kurds have faced real oppression, especially in Turkey, the Kurds have faced real oppression. But if those movements become the proxy for US designs, then they have a different divided character and can become largely a proxy force. I, I don't know enough about the particular details of the Donbass to say one way or another, but I think in analyzing that situation, we've got to be pretty cautious. Uh, so that's my own thoughts. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I completely agree with your answer with what you just said, but I, that is a lot. Uh, I wanted to say that I found your talk to be unbelievably courageous intellectually and politically and I want to find ways that we can get copies of this we can spread this everywhere we can there's parts of it I want to digest a lot more but from the early right on when you pointed out that the US military uh, the US imperialism doesn't need to wage wars it needs to win these wars and expand its empire and it failed to do so in the last conflicts I thought, I haven't heard others say this, mm -hmm. and I think it's quite correct. And uh, a lot flows from that. And they are working to have a war machine that is highly effective at destroying its enemies. And uh, they're not just throwing money into the military industrial complex, they're trying to have the money well spent for their, for their empire. And you got into all of that, and again, I'd like to get more into it and uh, dig into it myself, and I think others do. And uh, as a revolutionary, I share a lot of what you're saying. And I also really, really appreciate your reference to Karl uh, Liebknecht near the end. We have a special responsibility in this country to oppose what our own government is doing in this war. And there has been precious little of this. And when I heard that you were speaking here today, I wanted to be here for that reason. We need to have bust out of the, 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 the deadly science, silence that we have around a monstrous crime that is being hatched here. And I, I, again, I, 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 I'm only going to render less profound what you already said on a lot of these points. But I really think that this needs to be built on and spread both intellectually, politically, and in the streets. I want to point you all to uh, antiwar.com where Ryan had an excellent piece that came out a couple days ago on this matter. And it really, within a tight word limit, he really cogently uh, articulated the nature of the beast. And uh, so for what it's worth, one of the ways we can do that is spread his piece on social media because it's really, it's really, um, it's really excellent. So. Thank you. Just a quick thought on it. You know, the U.S. elite. Part of the problem I think they're facing is that, in a sense, they really do believe uh, their own anti-communist propaganda. That any state institution is inherently um, socialist or communist. So it was a big problem, for example, for them in Afghanistan, where they a big portion of the U.S. elite in their like, state-building efforts in Afghanistan felt that felt that if they built a proper client state, 
with government departments to regulate business, then that would be socialism. So they had to just let the free market <laughs> reign, which really meant that the CIA and the key producers of heroin, who were also in the sex trafficking ring, ran the country. Total black market stuff, including uh, Karzai's half-brother, Ahmed Wali, who ran the country, uh, a lot of the southern Afghanistan. And I mention that because, on the one hand, the U.S. capitalists, they have a unified, relatively unified interest to expand the American empire, to grow their market share, but they also have individual interests as a particular company to secure a weapons contract. Like, for example, Lockheed Martin spending, getting huge trillions of dollars for the F-35 was in the interest of the Lockheed Martin capitalists and the bankers who invested it. At the same time, going so far over budget is a big problem because it means that the social surplus that the elite extract from all of our tax dollars and paychecks, and not to mention you know, the capitalist exploitation that's going on, is not being well spent to secure the interests of the empire. And so this contradiction is playing out. And my impression is their levels of, of allowing for such open bribery, such decadence and corruption, have imperiled their empire, in a sense. Because it's so much just buying and selling of these contracts, regardless if things are ever delivered. Let me give you a different side of it, too. Because uh, I think your point's important, what you're getting at. That the American empire has a real interest. It's not just to blow up other countries for the sake of being bad in a cartoonish way. Of course, there are some cartoonishly villainous people in this country. But when the initial Russian invasion of Ukraine was botched in many respects, the key generals who botched this invasion, or parts of it, were, were fired. Now, I think Russia's still winning the war, but they're demoted. You know, the key people who made certain mistakes, or maybe didn't make the mistakes, but took the fall, were demoted. Every single US general who botched every bit of the war in Afghanistan and Iraq are, were promoted time and time again. This is a very decadent society we're living in, where the elite kind of rise to their own levels of incompetence. So or further. Further, yeah, even higher. You know, um, only when they have big scandals like with, um, uh, what's his name, uh, who leaked the stuff, gave all the documents to his mistress. Petraeus. Petraeus, yeah. Only then is that seen as too much. But messing up the whole strategy for a major war, eh, good enough, take a promotion. So, <laughs> next question. Brian, you, you said briefly that, that you thought that you're not in favor of nations that annex others' territories. And is that, if, am I correct and can I follow up on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, does, so if, if that's the case, what given, I mean, this was kind of like a chess game that was being played. Yeah. Uh, Putin or Russia was provoked. But they were also set up, right, mm -hmm. to be to pay huge prices, like all the sanctions and yeah. so forth. Which, by the way, to me, the economic san the attempt to make the economic sanctions work in some sense against Russia, that's kind of new in the waging of wars. Uh, in any case, what would you have suggested, Putin? You know, is it do you if you don't support Putin uh, hitting out militarily, what would you have? Advocate, and if you don't support the annexation, what would have been your uh, path for, you know, what would you have seen as the path he might have followed? Well, I'll answer your question, although it may be a different answer than, than you're expecting. I think that the problem is this, which is that there's a real, uh, how to put it, there's a real conflict of interest or a difference, divergence in interests between the interests of the people and the interests of the very powerful countries playing this game. Uh, that's why I said no matter who wins, the people lose. So from the perspective of great power politics, I'm sure Putin could have done more things one way or another. Uh, there's an argument that maybe not invading could have been more effective, although the invasion seems to have been fairly effective so far in securing Russian interests. As I mentioned, the revenues are way up in oil and gas. They are kind of using this to leverage a whole bunch of their influence globally. Uh, key countries like India and Brazil and Mexico who are part of the US sphere of influence are more siding with Russia than with the US in some respects on this. But the problem is that we have to see our interests as the people as diverging from these great powers, as fundamentally actually against them. Even if we also oppose, and I think we can do both, the, the US provocations here. Um, 
So that is to say, I think if we see us as primarily rooting for the rivals of the US, then we're still trapped in the same game. We're just rooting for the away team, not the home team. But I think this whole game is rigged against the common people in the US, in Ukraine, in Russia, in China. And unless we can find a way out of this mess, then I think it's just gonna go from bad to worse, even if a new big bully takes the position of the US as the top dog in the world. I, I like to comment that, that my understanding about India's support for Russia relates to the fact that they get all their weapons from Russia. You know, that, that there, are, there are economic uh, and military allegiances there that are difficult for them to break. They get a ton of weaponry from Russia. They get a, a bit from Israel, but the U.S. is trying to, as of uh, late last week, uh, they're working on offering a, I don't remember the amount, but it's basically an economic aid package to India in order to slowly uh, get them to buy more U.S. stuff. And I believe there's a summit coming up. I want to say it's in South Korea. I've been out of the news cycle for the last two days, but I want to say it's in South Korea. And that's where the U.S. is going to formally present this aid package to the Indian government. So we'll see what happens. Could I have one other thing? I, I've been struggling not necessarily with the same analysis, coming from the same analysis as being put forward here. But, you know, I, I operated a bookmobile in New York City. You know, like many people on the left or progressives or pacifists, have been trying to do outreach in, within the American culture unsuccessfully, like really terribly unsuccessfully. And that this was a wonderfully complex and, and useful analysis that you presented about both the, the historical background, economic, political background. But from the point of view of the average American that was mentioned before in the comments, this is like way up in the stratus. This is like beyond, beyond. They, they're looking, and of course, American ideology is based upon individual interests and how people are striving to just survive and progress in their own lives and so, so called for their children. Uh, I'd just like to ask that we consider having further conversation about how can the, uh, how can the propaganda of the culture itself be approached in a more fruitful way. Discussions like this as important as the information you're sharing is and the analysis, this is like magnitudes away from where people are starting at. And to talk about organizing the working class with a rich, this kind of rich intellectual uh, message, I, I think we need to talk more about that question. I'm just keep going across the room, so I'm going to go for Don, and then we'll come to you next. We're going in your presentation to find it hard to believe you don't support what Russia's doing. Because Russia stepped in there days before there was going to be another offensive against the people of Donbass, where 14,000 people were already killed. What was going to stop that? You know, that was the only thing. It was a choice. Do you stop the offensive or not? And they did. I think that was great. The people of Donbass have been looking for Russian protection since 2014, since the U.S. violent fascist-led coup in 2014 when they outlawed Russian. These people in, in the East said, there's no way we're going to live under this, and they, they, went, they became separatists. And, uh, you know, they deserve, they deserve protection. It's that fact alone is the, the reason I definitely support the Russian military action. But I have a few other points I wanted to mention. You know, most of the world supports Russia and what they're doing. The US, and the US, Europe, Japan, and Australia are about the only ones that don't. You know, so there's a whole, and this is the US plan for Ukraine, the long war. So you said you, you don't think that the, uh, this, this whole thing is the U.S. plan, so of course it's not a good thing. Nothing the U.S. has done since World War II is good. This is, this is what the U.S. had in mind. There's a, there's a discussion with McCain and Graham in Ukraine talking to the Nazis, saying this is going to be your time, we're going to go back to Washington. Have you seen that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. and Amy Klobuchar was there too. Yeah, she was there. She didn't say anything though. Yeah. But so. With, what year was that again? That was 2017, okay. the discussion. It, it, you know, it might have been 2015, but he was talking about 2017, so I'm a little confused. Okay. I can send you a link. I have no, it. No, I've seen the clip. I don't want to see that. Okay, I'll send it to you. And then 
when, when Zelensky tried to rein the Azov battalion in, he, this was in 2019, there's a video of him talking to an Azov general, telling him to like stop their offensive. The Azov general tells him to go fuck himself, yeah. basically. You see, you know, that one too, that's like, that's very clear, like who's in power there. You don't need to, you know, the pre he's telling the president to go, you know, they're not gonna listen to him. And the sanctions, also you mentioned a lot about that, but you didn't mention, you know, this, the Russia produces the majority of the world's fertilizer in Africa, India, and Brazil are going to be in really bad shape because of that, and other parts of South America, just mentioned. And unlike the U.S. war efforts, which why you said there were like, uh, they're failing. They're not failing, but they're just going slowly. They're not doing like an air raid in flattening cities. The only, the only time they did a really drastic air raid was in retaliation against the attack inside Russia. When they came back, they did a little, they did get a little crazy on that. But other than that, they're going slowly, house by house, making sure they don't injure civilians because they want a good relationship when the war is over. Yeah. Do, Don, do you, do you have a question? I, I, yeah, I my question, well, yeah, I'm getting to okay. why don't you support Russia, but I'm presenting the facts of why. You know? Well, let, let me, this let is me a discussion. Let's say this is a discussion. I, I disagree with you. I'm presenting why I okay, disagree with you. It know? makes sense. And I, I love what you're saying about breaking down the stuff with the Azov uh, battalion. The role, what McCain and Graham said, is very important. People need to know this. The point about fertilizer is key to it. I did forget to mention that. Mm -hmm. The thing about it is this, which is that from what I've seen in the situation and my basic analysis of Russia, and if we have disagreements, it's good to talk about, is that Russia is an imperialist country, a weak one, not, not compared to the, the US. It's very small. but. It has definite vested interests in controlling Ukraine. A number of the atrocities and things that they've committed, I know, have been overblown in the U.S. media. I do think that some of them are, are true. Usha was in look, Ukrainian. Usha was Ukrainian slaughter. Oh, the city of Usha. But hold on. But yeah. if you look at before this war, what Putin said, he said the Ukrainian nation is, is a fiction created by the Bolsheviks and Lenin, he said um, that they wanted decommunization of Ukraine, we will show them decommunization of Ukraine right. with this war, or military operation. It's clearly a very rightist articulation. It wasn't covered in any of the US media. It was a sophisticated rightist articulation. Putin's not a stupid, bloviating idiot like Trump. He, he, he's articulate. He's very right-wing, openly right-wing. Um, but it's clear he has a coherent right-wing ideology. Now, hold on, let me come to it. And then if you look at the domestic policies, and this is closely related you know, to what you know, going on in Ukraine, Russia is not, there's a lot of problems in Russia. For example, a few years ago, given the promotion of the right wings of the Orthodox Church, Russia decriminalized domestic abuse as long as the husband doesn't kill the wife. That's the sort of policies being promoted domestically. Uh, so I, I think, look, I, I think that Russia was provoked into this war. I think the U.S. Uh, provocations towards Russia, the U.S. sanctions, the military buildup, the exercise, they're outrageous. But I do think, at the same time, Russia's invasion should be opposed. The Ukrainian people will breathe easier after they drive out the U.S. back Nazis. That's all I've got to say. I think the people are going to be better off there than they are now living under a U.S. back Nazi regime. Well, I, oh, okay. Just one last comment. Yeah, I, I, I know we've talked about this a little bit before and we disagree. I, I think that in any sort of movement, like anti-war movement, my hope is that people who have disagreements like this and about other things, we can find ways to work together mm -hmm. to stand against the machinations of the war machine. Because we've seen things at times, people turn disagreements into reasons not work together at all. I know that's not what you're promoting, but I'm making a general point for us here and for the audience who's watching. Really yeah, great point. No, I just wanted to sort of summarize the whole thing and say that uh, while you bring excellent points and exactly what you know Ryan was saying here is our job living in the core of the beast, the belly of the beast, is first and foremost to dismantle the horrific military industrial complex. And we can do that in a number of ways, not just working class organizing, but local uh, legislative initiatives because war corporations, while they have captured the federal government, they are less successful at the state and local level. So if there's initiatives you can go with uh, banning war profiteering, for example. You can work on divestment campaigns. 
uh, pulling university um, endowments out of the war machine, out of war corporations, uh, state uh, pension funds as well. There are some steps. These are these are enormous tasks. I'm not saying this is easy, but our job as working class within the United States is to ally with the workers of the world and to do our part right here by getting rid of the single greatest purveyor of violence in the world, and that is the U.S. military industrial mm -hmm. complex. And I'm not saying you're, you're wrong on uh, any or more or all of those points, but um, it's, yeah, it's important to, for us to keep our eye on the ball. Sir? Oh, I'm not even on, I, I, yeah. we're going across. I just, um, that King didn't call the military industrial complex, but he said that America as a whole was the greatest yes. purveyor of violence, uh, or the government. And I wonder if, if a lot of industry and a lot of corporations, um, other than weapons manufacturers, aren't responsible for the rule of neoconsent and the need for the U.S. It's also just our psychology, the need for the U.S. to stay the unipolar power, um, even at the, at the cost of blowing the world up. Anyway, I'm sorry, so just the, the, the corporation and government, when they fuse, aren't just the military industrial complex, but a, a whole array that would like to see the U.S. stay uh, in control of world markets and see the petrodollar remain king. Sure, absolutely, and one of the things that we can do is to get rid of corporate personhood. We're not going to be able to do anything until we reverse all of those um, Supreme Court rulings that have steadily given corporations more power in government and in our society since the 1970s. We, that is first and foremost what we absolutely have to do because until we, uh, if, if we don't address that, then corporate rule will continue to destroy not just this country but the world as well. And yeah. Ma'am, I know you've been waiting very patiently to ask your <laughs> question. I'm sorry. Hi, um, my name is um, I appreciated um, your talk on corporations when you talked about SAIC, um, science, scientific, um, like it's a military corporation that was involved in, and AE something or other. Also, those those two corporations were involved in 9/11. Um, I started with my past, um, like I'm aware. Of I'm interested in Eisenhower. Um, in 1961, he talked about that military complexes um, are a threat to democracies. And since then, it's been increasing. Chile, 19, 9 11, 73, USA. And um, I listened this morning to something coming from Wellington, England, and they were talking about USA imperialist wars. It's not only Ukraine, it's all around. Um, so I started with uh, Ralph Nader, and he was against these corporations. Like everything that we do, then I went into 9-11, I, I um, invested in 9-11, that was my major thing, because I was warned about it three times. and. So the media took each the each country like the it, Afghanistan and that's related to drugs, you know. It's same as Cuba, it, the Al Qaeda is a drug cartel. It was about drugs. Uh, it still is banks and drugs. It's still the same thing today. The um, the pandemic. It's all and then it was Syria, Afghanistan. Yemen, uh, um, Libya, like it's it just goes increasing. And since 1991, um, when Russia collapsed, um, just to speak know, on so I don't know. Like it just it, it's much bigger than just Ukraine. Yeah, so absolutely. I don't want to just when I leave here and nobody out there is thinking about anything like what we're talking about. You know, and I write every day like. It's just bigger. Like, I don't want to get into one thing, and it's affecting economies worldwide. And, and um, yeah, I agree. Hardly anyone cares. <laughs> so, but I care. So, mm -hmm. so I, I don't know what the question is, but it's just bigger than one thing. It, it's a giant complex, like you talked about the corporation. Massachusetts Peace or Peace Action, they're trying to address these these military corporations, you know. They're, they're, drill, they're, they're, they're drilling in oceans. They want to drill because there's oil underneath it. It affects every area. 
Absolutely. And just to speak on one of the, the numerous points you raised, because you brought up a lot, you know, the, the promotion of far-right forces historically with the U.S. is often tied up with the drug trade, as people are probably aware, some of the stuff in Central and South America. You mentioned Afghanistan. Just to spell out what U.S. intervention in Afghanistan did, before the war in Afghanistan, there was basically no more heroin produced in Afghanistan, which earlier on had been one of the largest heroin producers in the world in conjunction with the uh, U.S. According to the U.S. own report, and Colin Powell actually toured Afghanistan in 2001, there was like very, very small, I think it was like 81 tons of heroin, which was a lot, but it, compared to what had been there before, it was almost nothing. It had largely been eliminated. By 2006, 90% of the world's heroin was produced in Afghanistan. 100% of the heroin consumed in the United States came from Afghanistan. The CIA worked very closely with the major heroin producers. I mentioned Ahmed Wali Karzai, who ran Kandahar and most of South Afghanistan until his assassination. Uh, him and others ran the heroin market locally with the CIA. Every time, and you can read about this from a crystal, Michael Flynn, they tried to investigate Ahmed Wali Karzai for all the corruption and shady things he was doing because the US military kind of wanted to get rid of him and put someone more pliable in place. The CIA protected him because he was involved in the drug trade. So yeah, you know, these far right forces, the drug trade, it's very much part of, of the whole way that they control other countries and populations. And it goes back, speaking of imperialism and colonialism, to the opium wars, for example, where the British and other European powers used the opium trade and mass addiction in opium to subjugate China. And it gives us a lot to think about domestically when the leading cause of death this last year for people under 50 was overdoses. I think it was over 100,000 people under 50 in the United States died from a drug overdose this past year. I mean, it's quite a, a striking thing. And that's why I think when talking about the divergence of our interests with the American corporate elite, the ruling class, we have to see this clearly. That They have no interest in helping us or protecting us. We're increasingly seen by them as a threat. The criminals. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, this is going to be a, a little bit of a small announcement. Sorry. So, uh, first thing, I'm, I, my name's Abby. I had the privilege of helping a little bit with this event, and particularly with just a really good group kind of came together under the umbrella of United Against War and Militarism, and um, this was an idea of intervention in, in the larger situation, how to really break out uh, the lack of a, a clear analysis and when we started talking about this about a month or two, there was a hope, I think, there would be more of a groundswell of opposition to the, the rush for NATO support. And we haven't seen that. But so that's where we are. So we have to go forward from there and, and, and build on what the, what's there. And I think this conversation was today was a good sign and a good step in that direction. If you haven't, there's a, a pamphlet that was put together pretty recently by our group, just putting a few points forward. Please read it, critique it, be in touch about it. And um, in New York City in particular, there's kind of a small group here, but in, in, the good part about this group, you know, against more militarism is there's been a lot of campuses, well, a handful of them yes. in different parts of the country, coming together and protesting yes. regularly over the last few months, both against this escalation, but against the military contractors in general. And so there are signs that things are, are starting to come together, not just with that effort, but it's one part of, I think, a growing consciousness, a lot smaller than we needed to see at this country, but there's a lot to build on. And I'm tremendously grateful for Christian for coming all the way down here for this trip. Um, I hope we can all in this room talk more after this too, if you have time. But um, one last thing is, it was just a few people putting this together, and there is a, a significant charge for the room. If people had a few extra bucks to contribute to defray those expenses, I think there's a jar in the front. I think if people, if within their means, if you had five or ten even, that would be very helpful for us. But um, you know, if not, sliding scale, don't worry. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for being here, and, and Ryan and Christian for your amazing presentations. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.